people, my name is Debbie Leone and I am the Information Services Manager for the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota. On behalf, on behalf of EFMN, I would like to welcome everyone to our webinar tonight. I am going to share my screen here real quick so that we can get started. Here we go. Okay, there we go. Um, our topic tonight is managing anxiety and depression in epilepsy. And this is a really timely topic because May happens to be Mental Health Awareness Month. And so we are very excited to be uh, partnering tonight with the Minnesota Epilepsy Group to bring you this webinar. A few housekeeping items before we move on to the content of the webinar. Um, we will be going for an hour and 15 minutes tonight. And in order for everyone to have the best webinar experience possible, we do encourage you to close out any windows that you might have open on your computer or a laptop or other device, um, especially things that are using a lot of bandwidth like music applications or streaming services. We are going to provide certificates of attendance um, that will be sent out within three business days uh, follow, in a follow-up email. And this webinar is being recorded, so a link to that recording will be posted on the EFMM website for future viewing. You will notice that we also have closed captioning activated. If you don't want to see those captions and you are seeing them, um, you should be able to see a close or a CC icon um, likely at the bottom of your screen and you can choose to hide the subtitles there. While the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota is um, hosting this webinar, all of the content and the discussion points are being led and delivered by our speaker from the Minnesota Epilepsy Group. Uh, the information shared is to inform you about various aspects of um, anxiety and depression and epilepsy. However, specific resources about your or your loved one's mental health should always be discussed directly with your neurologist or your mental health provider. We do encourage everyone to, to ask questions tonight. So if you have questions during the webinar, you can ask them by going to the Q&A icon that you should see toward the center bottom of your screen. Um, that Clicking on that will bring up a box and you'll be able to type in your question and then you'll be able to hit send. And our speaker is going to take time to answer as many of those submitted questions as possible. Um, our speaker will not be able to offer professional opinions about your individual diagnosis or treatment. And so for that reason and to respect everyone's privacy, please keep your questions general in nature and not specific to your own or to a loved one's mental health or physical health. You can also use that Q&A in case you have any kind of technical issues during the webinar. Um, our executive director, or executive, our executive assistant, Mary, you just got a promotion. Our executive assistant, Mary Mavison, is here with us in the background off camera, and she is there to help troubleshoot any kinds of technical issues you might have. So feel free to go ahead and put those into the Q&A. And to avoid any type of confusion, the chat feature uh, tonight has been disabled. So let's talk about our objectives uh, for tonight. They are to identify factors that may contribute to increased rates of anxiety and depression in people with epilepsy, to understand how to recognize anxiety and depression, to learn coping strategies for self-management, and to discuss when to seek professional help and how to access it. So I now have the great pleasure of introducing our speaker for the evening. Sharon Mason has been a psychologist with the Minnesota Epilepsy Group for 30 years, providing counseling and assessment to adults with epilepsy and non-epileptic events. She's particularly interested in helping individuals navigate the challenges of living well with epilepsy. Other aspects of life that she enjoys include family, emphasis on grandchildren, community, spirituality, gardening, cooking, hiking, and music. She has learned from her own personal journey that struggle is a part of the human experience and we need one another to find our way. We are very excited to have Sharon here with us tonight and I will now turn things over to her. Sharon. Thank you, Debbie. And thanks to you and Mary for um, arranging this and giving me the guidance to be able to, to be meeting with all of you this evening. So, I'm glad that you're all here 
and I wish I could see you face to face and be able to interact with you in, in a more personal way. But I'm also glad that we have the kind of technology that allows us to do this in this way. So tonight we're gonna to be talking about depression and anxiety and epilepsy. And I'm sure that each of you are coming with your own unique experience um, of both epilepsy and depression and anxiety. And so I'm hopeful that the things that um, I will offer are helpful to you and will add to your uh, already rich experience. So I am gonna be sharing some information, some, some statistics and some data, things that have come from um, people who have done research and specialized in this area. But I wanted to start out by making sure to, to let you know that it, most of my information has come from people like you who live with epilepsy or know and have loved ones who live with epilepsy. So that is really, where in the 30 years that I've worked in the field of epilepsy, I have met hundreds of, of individuals who live with epilepsy. And so that's where most of my information has come from, in, is from people and individuals. So, um, and I'm grateful to, to be able to share that with you. So as we, as we get started, we're going to um, ask, ask each of you to participate in a poll question. And this is the question. We'd like to know a little bit about who's here and what your relationship is to epilepsy. So if you could go ahead and respond, um, if you have more than one response, that's fine. And um, then we'll get a get a sense of who's here today. This is my first time using a poll. So Debbie and Mary, I don't, oh, okay. All right, it looks like we've got most of the people who are here this evening um, are folks that have epilepsy. There are a few that uh, have younger children. Um, and then there are some that have older children. And then it looks like there is at least one of you here that has a, a spouse or partner with epilepsy. So it's good to have you here. All right, so here's an overview of what we're gonna be talking about tonight. The first thing is just why it's important even for us to talk about depression and anxiety. We'll cover what depression is, what anxiety is, what some of the factors are that contribute to people having um, depression and anxiety and how we can improve our coping overall uh, to reduce the, um, experiences that we may have with depression and anxiety. And then we will talk uh, some about when we should get help. How, how do you know um, when, when you need to get help or when it's good to get help? And, um, and where do you get help? And then we will sort of end with some of my thoughts about how to live well with epilepsy. So let's start with why we should talk about depression and anxiety at all. And I think at this point, we can go to the next slide. I'm gonna go through each of these points that you see on this screen. Uh, and the first is that the reason it's important is because we're, we're complex people and um, individuals who have epilepsy are complex and, um, so this is a biopsychosocial model that looks at a way of us understanding the different components that actually contribute to illness and human suffering. 
And as you can see, a part of that is the biology, the, the physical health, some of the genetic vulnerabilities that contribute to people having epilepsy. And then there are many social factors that are also important as we look at people's experience with epilepsy. And then this third area is the psychological. And that's what we're going to be talking about. And as you can see, it's a, it's a, it's a big part of most illnesses. And it's important that we look at this kind of complex um, model and a complex interaction of each of these components of ourselves. And I like to add to that also our spiritual aspects that wasn't included in the original uh, psychosocial model, but I think it's an important part for us to also consider. And I want to just give an example of this while we look at this next model, uh, which is just another way of looking at that psychosocial um, or looking at that biopsychosocial model. And if you can see in the middle, it's the personal factors. And so if we think of ourselves as being kind of the center and all these other aspects of life that surround us and that influence us in many parts of our life, and especially because we're talking about it tonight, um, our illness or in our, our case, epilepsy. So we have family, we have the way that we interact with others, we have the health, um, health service areas that um, we look to for support, there's the greater community, and, and there's public policy that informs all of that. And so those are also, uh, this is just another way of looking at that as a whole person, we are in the center here. And so we wanna talk about, often we feel that we can't control much in our lives. And as you look at this wide circle here, there are parts of this, uh, our experience with epilepsy that doesn't touch us directly, but those things in the middle do. And so that's what I'd like to talk more about tonight. So another reason that it's important to, for us to talk about depression and anxiety is because we know that it's a problem. It's a problem in society in general, and it's an even greater problem in the world of um, epilepsy. And so here are some a few studies, and I included some of the changes that have happened. It's interesting to look at what's what's happened in the last 20 years with with some of the studies uh, in the general population we see that the rates of depression on a few of the national institute of mental health studies are between six and eight and a half percent and in the epilepsy population it's anywhere from 30 to 50 percent most recent uh, numbers show approximately 25 percent so that means a quarter of the people who live with epilepsy also experience depression. And this means a clinical depression, something that qualifies um, as a depressive disorder. Anxiety, as you can see in the right-hand column there, is about the same stats. So 25% of individuals in recent studies, a recent study last year indicated that they, they also struggle with anxiety. And um, as you can see in the general population, interestingly, anxiety is considered to be more of a problem than depression. I remember when I started out working in this field that most of the talk was about depression. In fact, we didn't even really do screening for anxiety until perhaps the last maybe five to eight years. So that's definitely been a, been a shift. And these numbers suggest that it's important for us to pay attention. So if we have, you know, 20, 25 people here tonight, that means that probably five, my math isn't that great, but five or six of you probably um, struggle with, with either depression or anxiety and perhaps both. So um, here are some stats that are also include numbers about, about kids. Um, 
we see that in the general population, the prevalence of depression is only about 3% in children age three to 17. Whereas in the pediatric epilepsy world, it is again about a quarter of those children with epilepsy are likely to also have depression. The next numbers uh, kind of just um, duplicate what we looked at, what we looked at before. Interestingly, I saw some numbers about the pandemic and just the general population, not, not specific to epilepsy, but that it's as high as approximately a third of the general population indicated that they were struggling with uh, depression during the pandemic. And so looking at some kids, uh, some numbers for children and teens related to anxiety, we see that it's about, it's about the same. Um, US prevalence for overall general population is somewhere between seven and 8%, whereas for, for kids, it's in, with epilepsy, it's um, upwards to, to 25%. And so we, we really do see that there is a burden associated with epilepsy that impacts children and adults. And so it's important for us to pay attention to this. And I think the fact that all of you are here indicates that it's also important to you. So I wanna add that even though we see these numbers that, that look pretty high, um, most individuals with epilepsy do lead what would be considered normal lives. And the ones who struggle are the ones that have the more difficult to treat epilepsy. So, which just makes logical sense. If, if you're dealing with seizures regularly and they're interfering with your functioning, you're much more likely to have some increased depression or anxiety, as well as some social and cognitive challenges. We also know that depression and other psychiatric disorders can actually have a greater impact on quality of life than the number of seizures a person has. I have, I have heard this repeatedly, and this doesn't mean that the number of seizures aren't important. It just means that there are many other factors that also are important when we're looking at, at quality of life. And I wanna just um, tell a bit of a story about when I started out working in this field many years ago, I remember one of the first young men that I met, that's probably why he, he stands out in my thinking, I'm going to call him Ben. And uh, when I met Ben, he was in his mid thirties. And I, he told me his story about developing epilepsy when he was a teenager. And this had a dramatic effect on his life. He had been a, a fairly social, outgoing young man. And when he started having seizures, it just completely changed his life. And he became isolative and quiet. And he was embarrassed and ashamed. And as he, uh, and he was having trouble with with seizure management and medication management. And so it made sense that he was struggling in the other areas of his life, including academically. He did graduate from high school, but Ben didn't go to prom. He didn't date, he didn't drive a car. And so he entered his young adulthood very differently than most of his peers. So, Let's fast forward to the time that I met Ben and what had happened to him in between his, his first experience of developing epilepsy and 15 years later when I met him. Well, it was difficult to, to talk to him about that because Ben had spent most of those intervening 15 years at home with his parents. He had done the occasional odd job, but he had become very, isolated and depressed. So when I talked to him, he just didn't believe that there was any other future for him. He couldn't see it. Um, and I assumed when, I, when we were talking that his seizures were continuing to have a huge impact on his life. 
come to find out that his seizures were under good control. So he had had a normal initial adjustment reaction to epilepsy of depression. And that's, that's a normal thing. But his had continued on into his young adult life. And he had sort of lost perspective on uh, what was happening to him, as often will happen when people have a chronic um, depressive state. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about Ben as we, as we go along. So before I kind of um, move into more uh, specific discussion about depression and anxiety, I wanna just talk about normal emotions because I don't know um, what most of your personal experience is with learning about emotion, but for me, I was raised in a, a home with two British parents. And so they had a kind of stiff upper lip um, attitude about life. And we rarely talked about emotions and expressing emotion was not considered an acceptable part of our growing up experience. I don't think, I think I saw my mother cry once and I saw my father lose his temper just a couple of times. So I grew up with this idea that having, having emotions was not a good thing. Um, I hope that wasn't all of your experience, but I know from the work that I do in counseling people that many people just have trouble with emotion in general. So let's move to the next slide. I think it's important for us to be able to acknowledge when we talk about depression, that emotions in general are an important and a rich and a valuable part of our human experience. And these, this range of emotion, sadness and grief and despair and joy and disappointment and excitement, all of them are natural reactions to life challenges. So feeling sad is not the same as being depressed. And strong feelings do happen for a reason. I remember the first time that I think I was in graduate school and one of my mentors talked about the importance of us being able to, as psychologists and therapists, understand our own emotions so that we could be more uh, receptive and responsive and helpful to others. And so that was an important learning experience for me to recognize that we all have strong feelings and emotions and that they're important for us to pay attention to because they give us valuable information. If we dismiss them or deny them, we're much more likely to have them pop up in other ways that aren't helpful to us. One of the um, one of the ways that depression is sometimes described is anger turned inwards. So if we're able to understand how to deal with emotion in a healthy way, we might be less likely to develop significant depression or anxiety. Because the truth is that often our really strong emotions are temporary and reasonable responses to significant events and changes. And that includes something like developing epilepsy. And this is especially true if it happens later in life, if it happens during teen years when there are these other significant developmental changes going on, if it happens during these significant times of life or, or any time, we would expect that there would be some adjustment and some temporary difficulty. That was the case for, for Ben that I spoke about when he was in high school. It was normal for him to have the reactions that he did. It was not normal for them to carry on year after year after year. So they might linger for a time, but when they begin to impact our day-to-day -day functioning is when we need to pay close attention. So what is depression? So it's definitely more than having the blues or feeling occasionally sad or even feeling sad and blue 
for, for a reason when you've had a, a loss or something disappointing that happens, it's, it's a normal thing, but depressive disorders are more than that. Uh, depression is a, is a medical condition that affects the body and affects our moods, and it also affects our thinking. And there's a range of severity and experience in each of these three areas that help, help us to get a sense of whether or not we are struggling with significant depression or not. And so when symptoms show up in the body, we're going to see increased fatigue or tiredness, people sleeping a lot more than normal. Occasionally people will, will have less sleep, but it's more typical with depression that people will just wanna to go to bed. You've heard the term, just go to bed and pull the covers up over your head and disappear. Um, appetite disturbance. So things that affect the body that are changes from what's normal. Depression is often accompanied by a loss of appetite, just a loss of interest in the things that will typically bring pleasure, including food and time with friends. Um, there'll be a loss of energy and things take more energy. So when someone is struggling with depression, one of the ways they might recognize it is that it takes a lot more energy to do the typical things that they can do without difficulty. That might include work. Sometimes I will hear that people just are exhausted from work, um, even though their work hasn't changed and they'll come home and need to recover. And so a change in your energy level, a change in your appetite or sleep can be an indicator that, that, the, that depression is affecting you in a physiological way. And certainly motivation is also um, something that will be impacted by depression, just a loss of interest in the typical things that you would normally enjoy. And mood, um, these are the things that are typically associated with depression, which is feeling sad and down, hopeless, discouraged. But it's quite possible that sometimes people will be depressed and not, have, not be aware of feeling sad or discouraged. They might just have an overwhelming set of changes in their physical stat status. They might notice that they're just sleeping more and more fatigued, or they might notice some thinking that it has changed. They might have these thoughts of feeling worthless and changes in how they feel about themselves. There might be feelings of guilt that they just can't get over. They'll be returning over and over again to things that have happened in the past that they feel badly about or regret. Regret is a huge part of some of the thinking that can be indicators that you might be struggling with, with depression. And then of course, thoughts of death. Um, it's normal for us as humans to consider our own death and to consider the reality that we will die. If we find that we are spending a lot of time wishing we weren't alive, that's, that's a pretty good indicator that there is um, significant depression. And the other um, way that it's helpful to, to consider what our level of depression is, is how much is it interfering with our day-to-day -day functioning? As I mentioned before, is it harder for you to do the things that you normally could do? Um, and is it, are these things distressing to you? Are you feeling overwhelmed by these thoughts to such a degree that you just don't see much room for, for the, happy, the happy thoughts that, that you want to have? And this was the case with this, this young man, Matt. He, he had gotten so used to feeling hopeless and worthless that he actually didn't quite recognize the degree of his depression because they had just become the norm for him. But, it, but he was significantly depressed and having more and more difficulty with, with daily functioning. He was stopping leaving his home. He wasn't caring for himself. He wasn't showering, uh, he wasn't eating properly. So all these things were indicators that things were, were becoming more serious. 
So let's look at what anxiety is. And again, anxiety disorders are different than um, us dealing with sort of the day-to-day -day stresses or feeling stress sometimes. It's, it's normal and typical. In fact, we should have a stress response when we are feeling threatened or if there is a, you know, if you're camping and you hear a, hear a bear at the next campsite, you should feel stressed and anxious and we should have uh, a response that allows us to uh, respond to the threat appropriately. But anxiety disorders are when there is excessive fear or dread that doesn't dissipate. And it might show up in certain ways. And some of you may have had your own experience with, with panic attacks. Panic attacks are an overwhelming sense of fear and dread, sometimes about particular kinds of situations. Uh, sometimes people will have panic attacks when they're going to be going on a, an airplane. They might have a panic attack when they're going out in public. They might have a panic attack when they're public speaking. Um, so these are times when people are overwhelmed by, by there can be physiological symptoms such as heart racing, um, an inability to be able to catch your breath, a feeling like you have to leave a situation, that can be an indicator of a, um, overwhelming anxiety or a, or a panic attack. Phobias, fears that are very, very specific. Um, storms are a pretty common one, um, sort of dramatic weather conditions, um, heights, Needles are common and um, often kids will have um, some health related phobias that are um, specific and pill swallowing. Um, so I don't know if any of you who have kids with epilepsy have noticed that pill swallowing is a, is a problem, but it can actually be a, a phobia and important to, to treat it differently than if it's just a um, sort of a small fear. Social anxiety, lots of people struggle with this, which is uh, feeling a sense of dread of being in public. And it's actually really about um, a sense of being scrutinized that, that it's not so much paranoia, but it's the sense of not wanting anybody to see them and wishing that they were invisible. And social anxiety is, is like that and will often contribute to the next um, type of anxiety, which is agoraphobia, which is a fear of leaving the house, or not so much of leaving the house, but actually a fear of being outside, being in public, being out in um, social situations. And, and separation anxiety, which uh, is, is more common in children, but it's also um, apparent in some adults. So those are all um, some of the ways that anxiety shows up and um, obsessive compulsive disorder used to be um, an anxiety disorder and it now has its own separate um, category, but it's a, also a common um, comorbidity with, with epilepsy. So let's stop here for a minute and um, we'll, we'll take another poll here. And um, what I'd like to know is what, what do you think of as being the primary reason why people with epilepsy do experience higher rates of depression and anxiety? If it's significantly higher as it is, seems to be in the general population, why might that be? And I've just picked a few here and would like you to choose uh, which one you think might be the most prominent. And it might be hard to choose because it's, uh, it probably feels like there is definitely more than one reason.
Okay, how are we doing here with our results? Okay, looks like a fairly even split here with um, loss of control being at the at the top with along with neurological effects of seizures, employment challenges is next, and, and medication side effects. And I'd be maybe the person who answered other will notice that uh, it shows up um, in the list that I've I've got here. Thank you for answering that. So we do know that it's it's a it is a combination of factors typically that is um, you know there's almost never just one reason why people struggle with depression and anxiety either with epilepsy or without. Um, but we do know that for people with epilepsy, it is a more complex interaction of the neurological factors and medications and social factors. And I think social challenges can sometimes be the, the biggest reason why, especially why people start out and begin feeling depressed or, or anxious. And I've listed some of, the, some of the, the major ones that I've heard over the years and that maybe some of you have experienced I want to talk a little bit about another young woman that I uh, have met more recently in the last 10 years. And she developed epilepsy when she was in her freshman year of college. And I had a chance to meet her shortly after that. And she was experiencing some of the expected adjustment challenges to this huge change for her at this critical vital time in her life. And I remember that she talked about she was doing okay through the school year and she was on campus. There was, there were, she didn't feel that she needed to talk about it because her seizures were reasonably well controlled. And, um, but when she went home for the summer, things were different because she couldn't return to her old job, which required driving. Um, so she found something that was close to home. She really couldn't get together with her friends because her parents lived in the country and she normally, she had her own car and she typically would drive and she couldn't do that. She was embarrassed to have her friends come and pick her up. And so she started to kind of stick more to herself throughout the summer and her family got concerned about her. And fortunately, when she returned back to school and was around friends, she began to um, sort of regain her sense of herself again. And during that time, she talked about the stigma associated with it. And she realized that she was partly contributing to the, to the perpetuation of the stigma because she wasn't talking about it. And so she decided that she was, she was going to disclose to a few of her friends and that she was going to talk about it in, and pull together a group of people to talk about epilepsy and to talk about the effects and to bring it out into the open so that it was normalized more and that people could see who she was and how she was coping and how she was managing it. And interestingly, it actually helped her to feel uh, it, it did help her to cope and manage more effectively. But there are lots of reasons why people have, and good reasons why people struggle with depression and anxiety along with epilepsy. I think that the loss of control, as some of you acknowledged, is one of the huge reasons. That sense of unpredictability, not knowing when you're gonna have a seizure, impacts. Um, people just feel on edge. They are nervous. They're worried. Um, I've talked to many people who don't want to go out because they're afraid of having a seizure in public. Um, and it's not just about the embarrassment piece, but it is about hurting themselves or um, not getting um, the help that they need. And so that loss of control is, is huge. Um, sense of self-esteem, sense of personal sense of who you are um, is also one of the big factors that, that contributes. 
And then there is the neurological piece. And we know that uh, the temporal lobe is a place where there are often seizure focus is. And it's also the place where many of our emotions are processed and start. And so it makes sense that for, for certain people, they are more likely to have some disruption in emotional regulation associated with their particular seizure disorder. And then aside from factors that are related to epilepsy specifically, family history, you know, there are other things that aren't related that can contribute to people having depression and anxiety. Um, and one in particular is whether or not your, your family has a history and that makes all of us more vulnerable to, to depression and anxiety. Well, maybe this is a good point for us to just stop and see if we, looks like we have a couple of questions. Um, Debbie, I'm wondering if you could help with these. Yes, I can. Let me take a look and see what we've got. Well, the first one is really uh, more of an epilepsy question than a um, than than a mental health question. But I'm I'm going to read it, and then if I mean maybe I can chime in here a little bit on this too. Uh, the question is, how does a person develop epilepsy? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the million dollar question. Um, Having, having been in an epilepsy group here and worked with uh, neurologists for, for 30 years, I hear them say many times, we don't know why. There are times when if, if someone might have a head injury, um, that, that can possibly be a, a secondary effect. But I would say most of the time, um, we don't know why. Yes, that's exactly how I would have answered it. I mean, there are there are certain things like a, a traumatic brain injury or maybe a brain tumor, um, maybe an infection in the brain that may have you know caused some damage. But yeah, mm -hmm. much of the time we just have no idea why any given individual might develop epilepsy. Yeah, we so have no. So it looks like this next question is about someone who, Jamie, who feels that their seizures are under good control, but they have issues with depression, anxiety, sleeping, um, work hard to better yourself. Um, uh, and it sounds like having having trouble sleeping is is an issue for you, and that does affect the next day as well. I think that there are lots of reasons why people have sleep difficulties. Um, depression is sometimes the case, but certainly it's not the only explanation. And I I do think it's important to try to understand and get a uh, some sort of an answer from your doctor as to why you might be having sleeping difficulties. It's hard for me to, to answer that, but I do know that uh, sleep deprivation really interferes with, with functioning on lots of different levels. So it's a good question to ask and a, and a good thing to get sorted out. Absolutely. Uh, the next question we have, so maybe you'll be covering this, but how do you tease out if the anxiety is due to the location of the focus of the of the seizure or if it's emotional? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think you can do that in a number of ways. You know, uh, sometimes in the hospital when when people come in and, and get hooked up and are evaluated and we can see them their seizure happening if we're if we're able to capture it on a on EEG and record it and if they perhaps have anxiety symptoms that are clearly associated with like the onset of the seizure itself um, or the aftermath of the seizure sometimes we're able then to to kind of pinpoint and say this could be related to this to the seizure itself I think that in my experience, um, Lori, it, it, in some ways, 
it doesn't matter because I think we would manage it the same way. Um, we would still encourage uh, certain kinds of relaxation exercises, certain kinds of um, breathing techniques, ways of um, paying attention to when you are anxious and um, trying to figure out how to manage those particular triggers differently. So it, it often is important for us to understand, I guess, but, but sometimes we just, we just can't. And so if you don't feel like there are reasons in your environment um, that, that contribute to you being anxious, that's, that could be an important indicator that it's maybe more seizure related. I still think you want to manage it the same way, though. Thank you for okay. that answer. Do you want to continue to take a few more? Or Let's do you want see. to hold them? Um, so are there certain anti-epileptic medications that contribute to higher incidence or links to depression? Yes, there, there are some. Uh, there are some that um, contribute to improved mood, and um, there are some that have been linked to higher incidence of, of depression. This is, um, I'm not a uh, physician, so I don't want to um, say, give a lot of information about specific medications, but certainly Keppra is one that we are watching and um, take care to pay attention to if people have mood symptoms after they're on the medication. I think any medication has that potential. And, and so usually when people are started on a medication, we watch closely to see if there are changes in mood that we can possibly link to the medication. Um, and also we find out what's going on in people's lives to see if there are other life factors that could be actually contributing. Okay, great. Okay, and this sec next question is, is similar, uh, how to differentiate between depression that affects mood and anti-seizure medication. You know, in many ways, they sort of feel the same. They show up the same in the, in the body or in the, sometimes the um, medication effects, we will see perhaps more of the thinking uh, disturbance. So people who have never had suicidal thinking will all of a sudden develop a suicidal thought. Uh, that, and, and especially if they have just recently been on a medication, started on a medication, I think the you look for that direct association to, to kind of make a prediction about um, whether or not it could be medication related. Is it usually pretty early on in starting a new medication that uh, any kind of mental health side effects typically, typically show up? Yeah, typically that's the case. And um, yeah, I think you know, we just have to do kind of a careful, that's, that's why in some of the bigger epilepsy centers, there is a psychology component and a multidisciplinary approach that says, we need lots of eyes on you as an individual, Lisa, to try to figure out whether or not this could be medication related or mood. So part of it is, is when your uh, physician knows you well and is able to see these changes and when others around you are kind of watching out to see whether or not there are changes related to medication. It rarely will pop up just out of the blue after you've been on a medication for a year and it, that it would be related to medication. That's much more likely to be something related to a situation or other parts of your life. And I like the point that you made about the, um, you know, that, that multidisciplinary approach to treating epilepsy. And that is why we often at EFMN, if someone tells us they do have, in addition to epilepsy, they're experiencing mental health issues, we often will suggest that they try to be seen at a comprehensive epilepsy center because there is that opportunity to have, as you said, those different sets of eyes working together as a team right. to try to figure out those things rather than try to do this with your neurologist and this with a the therapist to have everything together to help figure out that interplay. Yes, and I think the other piece to add to that is that the, the other benefit is 
um, just the acceptance piece that um, is present in a multidisciplinary epilepsy center, which is that we know it, that you're, there's a likelihood that you will also have mood issues. So it's, it comes, comes back to this treating the whole person that you are not just, a, it's not just about epilepsy, you're a whole person. And um, in order to treat the epilepsy well, um, we need to know and treat the, the whole person and understand the whole person, including mood. So let's save the rest of these, I think, Debbie, until okay. the end, especially well, sure this next one is a good yep. one from yeah, Nina yeah. to add um, when we talk about coping. Okay, so let's move on and talk about, about coping. And going back to what I was saying about sort of emotional well-being, I, I think that one of the most important things that I've learned in my career is the value of giving space to our difficult emotions, to our strong emotions, to sadness, to anger, to loss, that we allow them to, to have space that, that they need to have and that we need them to have in order for us to move on. Um, I've had some of my own loss and sadness in my life and I know that I needed the time to, to grieve and um, I couldn't rush that process. It, it just has a life of its own and it takes as long as it takes. Um, and that is different for everyone. But I think when we give, um, when we sort of honor these difficult emotions, even though they're hard to feel, um, we're much less, less likely to develop chronic um, sadness and chronic anger and chronic loss because we have been able to, to work through them and, and to acknowledge them. The next thing is that we cope by also bringing, moving towards things that bring you joy. I like the idea of kind of expanding who we are, you know, that, and that epilepsy is only a part of, of who you are and that there are many other components, many other pieces. And when we can make some of these other pieces bigger then the epilepsy can feel at least and seem smaller. And this is true with lots of things in life. If people are dealing with, um, you know, dealing with a divorce and um, they, that feels, and it should feel huge for a lot of, a lot of time and as long as it needs for people to work through it. But over time, it's important to remember this is just a small part of who I am. And I want to bring back into my life the things that, that bring me joy. And then the, the other part of this is being able to kind of be present to the moment that we have. This is today is the day that we have and we can do what we can today, even if it's a small thing, with what we have, with what we understand, with what we know, we just do something to help us cope. I remember when I was uh, working with Ben that we started small with him. And so some of his first tasks were that he, you, you get up and dressed first thing in the morning. You leave the house and you leave the house at a certain time and you are gone for a certain amount of time before you come back. Those were the things that he could do. And he eventually became able to, to function at a much higher level and was able to, to work. But it started with this small step um, of doing what he could do that particular day. And then we have some more, I, I did talk about this, keeping epilepsy in perspective, that it's just one part of you. It does not define you. Other things that, that okay, here's a poll question. I forgot this was coming in here. All right, so this next question is, what do you think helps you cope with depression or anxiety? And I'd like you to pick a, a couple of things from this list.
All right, how are we doing with that? I sort of clicked out, I think, Debbie or Mary of the poll. I think we can probably go ahead and, and uh, launch the results now. Are you not seeing it? I see it now, thank okay. you. So here's what you what you folks find to be helpful. Um, looks like most important is hobbies. I think that's that sort of uh, finding joy in the other parts of who you are. Friends, support, yes. Um, looks like a few of you have found counseling to be helpful and your faith to be important. Medication and Meditation, I just realized how close those are <laughs> in spelling. Um, so that's great. Thank you for, for answering that. And some of those are on um, are also what I, I have thought of as being important in improving quality of life. Um, I think that the emphasis on treatment for depression and anxiety is important, and we will talk about that. But I'd like to I'd like to suggest that just as important as sort of treating the symptoms of depression is actually doing what we can to take steps to improve the quality of our life, and it might might involve any of those pieces here: being in nature, listening to music, exercising spiritual practices. Volunteering, interestingly, has been found to be one of the most helpful ways to, for people to especially find relief from depression. And, and spending time with positive people is definitely a significant. Um, we all have had our share of um, negative people in our life and, it, and sometimes we can't um, ban them from our lives, but we do wanna make sure that we have room to, to spend time with, with positive people. I'm sure you've all had the experience perhaps of feeling down one day and you spend a couple hours with a friend who helps you to laugh and you realize as you're on your way home, I feel better. Okay, and now there, there are also some important lifestyle factors that we should be paying attention to. And um, that includes stress management. If we can figure out what our stressors are that are contributing to us being anxious and depressed, that's that whole area of controlling what we can control when so much of our life is out of control, paying attention to what we can control. Sleep, here, here it is again, chronic sleep deprivation is, is a real problem for all of, all of us. And it also is a problem for people with epilepsy because it increases seizure frequency and it inhibits good cognitive functioning and it affects irritability and mood and behavior. And so exercise goes kind of right along with this. Um, and um, I, I interest, was interested to read recently that in Great Britain, when their, their first line of uh, treatment for depression is exercise. Before medication and before counseling, physicians will, will prescribe an exercise regimen. And so I think that's um, interesting to, to think about and pay attention to. And then the idea of continuing our daily um, activities and functioning as much as we can is really important. Just carrying on, keeping on, doing what we can do today. Sometimes it's a small thing. It's maybe getting done one thing on your list um, because often when people are depressed and anxious, especially with depression, they are overwhelmed. And so if they, they get behind on things and then they become overwhelmed and then, then the tendency is to just stop doing anything. And so one of the ways out of that is to, to commit yourself to doing something, to, to move yourself forward every day and focusing on what you can do, not what you can't do. So here are some suggestions about how you know when you should get help. 
I mean, there's that list of symptoms that I went over. And I think those are important for, for, for you to pay attention to and for people who are in your life to pay attention to. But one of the most important times for you to get help is when you just want to, when you want to feel better. Um, I, especially with young teens or uh, young adults, when they come to see me and they come in and they sit down and I ask them why they're there and they will say, well, because my parents made me come or my, my husband or wife wanted me to come. It's really not gonna work very well. And so the best time when you're likely to get uh, help is when you really want to. So when you find that your symptoms are interfering, when it's, you know, it's one thing, if it's just a, a, a temporary experience, but when you wonder whether this is really getting in the way of me um, enjoying my life, of me interacting with people, of me getting to work on time, uh, sometimes it will show up in ways like just being late. Um, so when your symptoms are interfering with your life is a good time to get help. When you find that you're self-medicating, this is a big problem, uh, whether it's with alcohol or uh, marijuana or other pain, pain medications, um, finding that you are dependent, um, even emotionally dependent, might be a time to consider that you might need to, to get some help. And part of it, the, the reason why, there's a reason why people self-medicate and it's because it makes them feel better. You know, it makes you, if you're, it actually doesn't help with depression, but it does help with anxiety. Uh, usually when people are struggling with depression, especially alcohol, it's a depressant. And so people will feel more depressed. Um, with anxiety, it, it can help, it can help to calm you. And so there's a reason why, but those things also, alcohol and marijuana will mask um, the problems. And that's not helpful because they're, they're still there. Another time when you know that it's good to get help is when people who care about you express concern and ask you to. And then when you just know yourself that your level of hopelessness is significant enough that um, you need to be able to talk to someone about what you can do to manage it differently. And so when you know that you wanna get help, what, what do you do and where do you go? Well, there's different kinds of help and it depends on what it is that you're struggling with and what you would like to see improve. Um, so you can start a good starting place is with your primary care physician or if you have an epilepsy specialist that you have a good relationship with, talking to them about it is a good starting point. They then might be able to direct you to whether the best route to go is to psychiatry where you can get a medication prescribed or um, to a psychologist for therapy. Certain kinds of um, levels of depression and anxiety are best helped with both um, a medication and therapy, but not all. I often, with, especially with depression, if it's not um, uh, at a level of um, suicidality, I will encourage people to start with therapy and see if they and are able to affect enough change so that they don't need medication. There's nothing wrong with medication. Uh, sometimes people really need it, especially when we know that there, there's some brain chemistry that possibly is involved. Um, so I'm, I'm not against medication by any means. And there are certain conditions, um, especially um, anxiety, such as obsessive compulsive disorder that typically really does need medication to help people get a handle on things. So once you've gotten a referral, then um, you, you can either check, you can check with your insurance company or sometimes you can go directly to your insurance company who will give you some recommendations. And if you tell them that you have epilepsy, they, they will often have specialists who work with people with epilepsy. Um, or you can ask your um, epilepsy, um, your neurologist for any recommendations that they might have. Um, I put a website on here, psychologytoday.com, which is a really great resource for, 
finding somebody, somebody local, and you can sort of um, indicate what part of the city you live in and whether you want male or female and what your concerns are, and you'll, you'll get a number of um, recommendations and people you can, you can check out. And then of course, support groups, uh, the Epilepsy Foundation um, is a great place to go for all kinds of support. So I wanna wrap up by just some, some things that um, I, I think I'd like to leave you with um, as you think about how you can live well with epilepsy. And I'm hoping that some of you already are living well with epilepsy and I imagine that you are. Um, and if you can think about what can I do to improve how I am living with epilepsy, how I am managing my anxiety and depression. And I think that the first thing is that you are a unique and valuable human being and that what you bring to the world is significant and important and that you have a place and you have something to give. And I know that living with epilepsy and living well with epilepsy requires courage and creativity. I'm amazed at the creativity of the people that I have worked with and the courage. One of the things that I remember talking to Emily about was uh, when she was frustrated by why she had to be the one who had to deal with epilepsy. And I remember talking to her about the things that she was learning that other young people her age hadn't had the opportunity to learn. She, she was facing and dealing with loss and disappointment and discouragement. And she came to a place of recognizing that she actually had some strengths that other young people her age who had not been through similar challenges um, that they did not have. And so she saw it as she didn't ever wasn't able, able to say, I'm really glad that I'm thankful that I have epilepsy, but she was able to say, I'm thankful that I have learned that I can be someone who copes with difficult things. So part of that is kind of reimagining hope. We all have a, an idea in our minds of what our future is going to look like. And when something comes in and interrupts that, it requires uh, or, or invites us to to mourn the loss of what we had imagined our life would be and watch for something new and kind of reimagine what does that look like for me to live well with epilepsy. And then, as I mentioned before, that might involve growing the other parts of you bigger. Um, and I'm glad to see that some of you are already doing that, who have hobbies and, and friendships that help to, to keep you um, thriving in your life. And so that's the last one is I think that we all live better lives when we have people who we can reach out to su for support. And that also takes courage sometimes uh, when we're feeling alone, uh, which many, many folks do who, who live with epilepsy. So reaching out for support and also giving that to others. And I want to end with a quote by one of my favorite philosophers. I think that almost anything that you read from Winnie the Pooh will have really good wisdom for us in life. Today was a difficult day, said Pooh. There was a pause. Do you want to talk about it? asked Piglet. No, said Pooh after a bit. No, I don't think I do. That's okay, said Piglet. And he came and sat beside his friend. What are you doing? asked Pooh. Nothing really, said Piglet. Only I know what difficult days are like. I quite often don't feel like talking about it on my difficult days either. But goodness, continued Piglet, difficult days are so much easier when you know you've got someone there for you. And I'll always be here for you, Pooh. And as Pooh sat there working through in his head his difficult day, while the solid, reliable Piglet sat next to him quietly, swinging his little legs, he thought that his best friend had never been more right. So thanks for having, it's been good to have this time with you. And we do have a little bit more time left and I, I don't know, I, it looks like we have three questions here and we only have about, oh, four or five minutes left um, okay. because before I need to do a wrap up. So All right. um, if we maybe can 
get to as many of these as we can. Um, this was the one you said earlier is a good question, and I agree. Um, Dana says, I also feel that media, like the current tragic news, can add to current anxiety, stress, and depression. I was yeah. told not to watch the news before going to sleep. I also participate with a small yoga class with church friends and learned how to do the yoga breathing and meditation to help relax. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because I think today's been a hard day for oh, many people. It sure has. Yeah, I was thinking about that when I was getting ready to talk to all of you. And I know that we do have this inclination to sort of avoid these difficult things. And on one hand, we can't avoid them because they're in front of in front of us. And we shouldn't avoid them because these difficult, horrible things are a part of a part of our human experience. And so somehow being able to to hold those things, but not allow them to cause us to despair, I think is the big challenge. And I think what you're saying, Dana, is helpful that if we can um, do that with the sensitivity to how it will affect us so that we don't um, expose ourselves too much because it's traumatic. It's, it's traumatic. These things that we saw yesterday are traumatic for, for all of us. Um, and also to find ways to relieve our, our bodies and our spirits of the heaviness like yoga and meditation and faith. And all of these things help to kind of lead us back to, to things of purpose and meaning um, when, we, when we have questions that we don't have answers to. Thank you for that, Tina. Thank you. I think, like I said, I know that we've had discussions in our workplace today about what's been going on in the news, and I think it's hard for everyone um, right now. Um, uh, Jamie, you had a question here that I, I don't think necessarily is one that, um, for Sharon, um, it has more to do with Social Security and, and um, that type of thing. If you want to um, call EFMN, I am not working tomorrow, but I will be in on Friday. And if you want to call or reach out um, through our website, I'm happy to talk to you a little bit about um, the situation and see if we can come up with any um, assistance for you. And I think what, what Jamie's question speaks to, doesn't it, is the importance for all of us on, on having things that, that help us to feel normal and things like a car when you can drive if you have epilepsy is a pretty important thing. So I, I totally uh, appreciate that, that question and what, what's driving that. And how hard it is to live on a limited income. This is, this is challenging for many people. Uh, and to feel like you have the quality of life that you would, you would like to have. And it does require creativity to be able to figure out how, how do I do that? Um, so thank you for that question, Jamie. And then we did have just a thank you for this great information. And I am going to second that. Um, this has been just a delight. I have enjoyed this. I've learned a lot and I hope that everyone else here has as well. Um, as we wrap up, I do want to remind everyone about who the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota is and what we do. We lead the fight to overcome the challenges of living with epilepsy and to accelerate therapies to stop, to stop seizures, find cures, and save lives. That's why we're here. That's why we do what we do. Um, I do want to remind everyone, as I mentioned to Jamie, um, we do have information services available. Um, through that program, we do provide free one-on-one -on -one support to individuals who are looking for information on just about anything related to epilepsy, whether it is, um, you know, questions about finding a new neurologist or questions about applying for disability or financial assistance questions. Um, we, uh, we work with you with the questions that you have. So uh, if we don't have the answers or the direct resources to help you ourselves, we do the very best we possibly can to find that information for you and, and find those resources um, that would be able to help you. 
And then finally, I want to invite everyone to be sure to attend our next Wellness Wednesday webinar, which will be in June, on June 29th. And our topic that month will be childhood epilepsies and seizure types. And our guest speaker that evening will be Dr. Anthony Fine, who is a pediatric epileptologist with the Mayo Clinic. Um, so again, thank you to Sharon Mason for being here. Uh, for sharing this great information and for taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, and I want to thank all of you who've participated as well and, and uh, for your good questions, for, for taking time out of your busy schedules, because I know we're all busy these days. Um, we appreciate you being here and we hope that you will join us again in the future. So thank you and I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you.